take a journey with me. We are traveling at 99% the speed of light through deep space. It has been five years in perceived time since we left planet Earth. On the first manned mission in a revolutionary new rocket that has redefined what mankind is capable of. It is just you, me, and a group of AI-operated robots that do the dangerous work and calculations we can't do. On Earth, everyone we have ever known has aged 36 years compared to our five. Since we are traveling at 99% the speed of light, any radio wave communication sent from Earth wouldn't reach us because the radio waves wouldn't be able to catch up to us. So there is no communication with anyone on Earth. The advancements being made on Earth are completely unknown to us. We have traveled unimaginably far away from Earth, yet we have just passed the nearest star in our galaxy, Proxima Centauri. We realize how small we are on a level that no one else ever has. Even at the speed of light, it would take 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way galaxy in diameter. There's an estimated 170 billion galaxies in the known universe. Yet we have passed one star. The accomplishment is huge. But what's next? Is this the pinnacle of humanity? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Even if we go for the rest of our lives, we won't even make a dent in the exploration of our galaxy let alone the universe itself. Every moment that passes, the odds we make it back to Earth shrink. Even if we turn back now, in five years when we make it back to Earth, 72 years will have passed on planet Earth since we left on our voyage into space a mere 10 years ago. Unless some miracle anti-aging technology was released when we were gone, nearly everyone you knew, your family, friends, co-workers, will be dead. If you had children, they will be much older than you. That is, if they are alive in the first place. Was the lifeless vacuum of space worth the cost of entry? Was the visualization of infinity all you hoped it would be? <laughs> Maybe a little dramatic. Okay, okay, I know what you're thinking. What the hell is this guy talking about? Are you serious? Is this actually possible? Well, technically, yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, to our knowledge, it is impossible for anything with mass to accelerate to the speed of light. But 99% the speed of light is a different story. Now, it's definitely possible in theory, but there are some massive hurdles to jump in order to make this happen. And I mean massive. But it just so happens that NASA employee Dr. David M. Burns released a new concept for an engine that theoretically, according to the math, could reach 99% the speed of light. It's called the helical engine. Elon Musk initially proposed the theoretical idea of the helical engine in 2017, and now Elon and NASA allegedly have plans to take on the project. That means if they could do the impossible once again, time travel will become a reality. Okay, so how could we reach 99% the speed of light, and how does this have anything to do with time travel? Let me explain. The first piece to this puzzle is making something that can accelerate mass to near the speed of light. And of course, this is where the helical engine comes in. If you didn't know, 99% the speed of light is fast. Unimaginably fast. Like, ridiculously, doesn't comprehend, Little monkey brain goes here or there, speed of light zooms that way, you're confused. So am I. About this fast, to be specific. In Dr. Burns' concept paper for the helical engine, this is how he describes it. A new concept for in-space propulsion is proposed in which propellant is not ejected from the engine, but instead is captured to create a nearly infinite specific impulse. The engine accelerates ions confined in a closed loop to relativistic speeds. Yeah, I know, that's confusing. This explanation's a little easier to understand. As a thought experiment to explain his concept, Burns describes a box with a weight inside, threaded on a line with a spring at each end, bouncing the weight back and forth. But if the mass of the weight were to increase in only one direction, it would generate a greater push in that direction and therefore thrust. But Burns' drive isn't a single closed loop. It's helical like a stretched out spring, hence helical engine. The engine accelerates ions confined in a loop to moderate relativistic speeds, and then it varies their velocity to make slight changes to their mass. 
The engine then moves ions back and forth along the direction of travel to produce thrust. Burns says the biggest issue facing this is engineering, which is kind of obvious. For one, it would have to be huge. I'm talking 656 feet long and 40 feet in diameter, just for the helical chamber. It's like shooting a 60-story building into space. Except a lot lighter, obviously. Okay, great, Dan, I get it. The frickin' engine has the potential to reach 99% of the speed of light. But where does the time travel come into this? All right, let's get into some science. You were most likely taught about general relativity, more specifically, Einstein's special theory of general relativity and time dilation in school. But you also probably forgot about that on the bus ride home. But that's okay. Basically, the faster you go, the slower time ticks for you. This all has to do with space-time. Before Einstein, the general consensus that Newton came up with was that time was linear. But then, good old Einstein came around and changed the way we think about everything by introducing the space-time continuum. Instead of space-time being separate, he proved they were inextricably linked, suggesting that space-time expands and contrasts depending on the momentum and mass of nearby matter. So time slows down as you travel faster because momentum and mass bends the fabric of space-time, causing time to pass slower. The same thing happens with a strong gravitational force such as a planet. The stronger the gravity, the more space-time curves and the slower time itself proceeds. The mass of the object literally bends space-time itself, changing the way that object goes through time. Oh, and by the way, this has literally been proven with the particle accelerator. Neil, you mind taking this one over? You, you, you just explain it so well. Okay. Thanks. There are particles that decay. You've heard of like radioactivity, right? Yes. One of these uh, decays in like six minutes when it's left out, okay, when it's not part of an atom. What happens if you take that particle and speed it up in a particle accelerator? So you take a, 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 a community of these particles, speed them up, calculate, wait a minute, the internal wristwatch on these clocks says they should live longer. And sure enough, their decay time takes longer. Oh my God. Yes, yes. So the, oh, wow. Yes. And that becomes, yes. that becomes living proof of what yes. Einstein said. Yes, because we can't go half the speed of light. Right. But you can accelerate a particle to do that. Time gets incrementally slower the closer you get to the speed of light. If you could somehow reach the speed of light, time itself would come to a full stop, which is why photons don't age or have a concept of time. Uh, Neil, just, just one more time. One more time, I'm so sorry. If photons had a clock, the clock would never tick, which means that photon, when it was born, at the star that emitted it, was detected at my telescope in the same instant, according to the photon itself. The photon has no knowledge, no knowledge. of that trip. Right because time did not exist for it. They're Imagine traveling 30,000 years and land on someone's buttocks. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, like, come on, Let, let's, let's be totally honest for a second. It's only bad if you get the wrong butt. You're not fooling anyone, Neil. I know you don't always point those telescopes at the sky. If you live near the Hubble, you better close your windows. I was just examining the photons as they come into contact with the anus. Yeah, right. And, and I was just uh, examining the photons on my laptop screen last night at three in the morning. Mm hmm You know what? New rule. Yeah. That's on when you're using the house. Seems like yeah. a sensible rule. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I had to do that. I, I, I know, we're serious, right? Talking about space. Speed of light. I, I know, I know, I know. Anyway, I'll leave some videos in the description if you want to understand time dilation and all that a little bit better. But for now, all you need to know is that something traveling at 99% the speed of light will go through time seven times slower than we will on Earth. So, five years traveling at the speed of light corresponds to roughly 36 years on Earth. Okay, got it? 
Time isn't linear, space-time is one, and depending on the speed and gravitational force, you experience time differently. Does this mean you live in slow motion? Uh, no. No, you don't consciously live in slow motion or anything. It's relative, right? It's like when you're on a plane, you don't feel G-force the entire time. You only feel it when you're accelerating. So, you experience time normally. So this means if we get the ship to work, we can time travel? Yeah, well, not exactly. It's complicated. Space is, uh, it's really dangerous, if you didn't know. With an average temperature of negative 455 degrees, space dust, all sorts of radiation, and space dust, if you're traveling at nearly the speed of light and you hit literally anything, it's gonna be bad. I mean, you know how it hurts when you stub your toe? Like, just up that by a, a, a billion. I mean, this would be a logistical nightmare. We would somehow have to create AI that can detect objects at nearly the speed of light and then alter the course of the ship, creating pathways for us to travel through and also somehow protecting the people inside from the radiation. But somehow we exist and who the hell knows how that happens, so I'm not going to be the one to say it's impossible. Either way, unless we are doing it specifically for the sake of time travel, we wouldn't have people in the ship. With the progression of AI and robotics, we would most likely just send a bunch of robots. But we would have no idea if they survived until the ship does or does not come back generations later. If we really want to physically explore outside of our own galaxy, wormholes seem to be the only option. So, uh, you know, if you want to get on that, I'd appreciate it.